Good morning, students. Today I am going to take a poem after blending. After Blenheim by Robert Sati. Alright, now this poem was written in the year 1900 and 1796. 1796. And this poem is talking about a battle that took place in this particular place, Blenheim. Alright, Blenheim or Blenheim as it was, Blenheim as it was called, was a place in Austria or a part of Germany. The, or German, or southern Germany. The southern part of Germany. The southern part of Germany on the banks of a river Danube on the banks of on the left bank of the river Danube so that is the place where the battle is taking place and the uh, cause for this battle was a very trivial one very trivial that means very simple cause the cause for this battle was the Spanish succession. So, therefore, the name of uh, this war is known as the War of Spanish Succession. Right? In the year uh, 1700, the Charles Second of Second of Spain. Charles Second of Spain dies childless. So the, the King of Spain, Charles Second dies in 1700 without having a successor. Because he was childless. Right? As a result of this, and his nearest heirs, the people who are connected with him, who are close, uh, closely related to him, belonged to two families. One was the Austrian. And the other was French. Two families. The one was the Austrian family, that was the Habsburgs, right? Habsburgs, the Austrian family of the Austrian family of Habsburgs was a uh, closely related to him and the French family of Bourbon. Right? And the French family of Bourbon. So, now, the situation was that the, uh, the king of Spain dies in 1700 leaving no issue, no child. And uh, the families that had a right to succeed either belonged to the Austrian family of Habsburgs or the French family of Bourbons. And then the then the issue was now who will succeed to the throne of Spain? Who will succeed to the throne of Spain? And uh, the naturally it should be the Habsburg 
or the Bourbons. Now, the succession would mean that uh, they become very powerful. If the Austrian prince succeeded to the throne of Spain or the French king succeeded to the throne of, the, throne of Spain, it's going to impact the balance of power in Europe. Balance of power in Europe is going to be disturbed. In other words, in other words, the Spain become either part of French or Germany. So that there is going to be a big issue. So the balance of power is going to be disturbed. In other words, Spain is going to become so powerful and that is the cause of uh, this war. Therefore, the armies of the armies of England who had a great interest in Europe entered into a war on the side of against against this happening. So, so you had the uh, You had the Franco Bavarian combination. So because this was part of Bavaria, right? The the Austria one part of the Bavaria, the Prince of Bavaria was interested in it, and so also the French. And the, the French and Bavarians combined together, fought against the British, but against the British. And the two names that come up here are the Prince of Marlborough. The Prince of Marlborough and uh, the, the, the Duke of Marlborough of The Duke of Marlborough and the Prince Eugene. Prince Eugene of Austria. These were the, the two people who led the forces, the combined uh, uh, forces. And here you have, they, they became very famous because of this uh, battle. And we have a name. And this, this is, uh, these are the, this, uh, one who led the uh, uh, battle against uh, the Franco Bavarian army. The, it was the Duke of Marlborough who led it, led it and uh, against the uh, general Prince Eugene who led the Franco uh, Austrian troops. Franco Bavarian troops. Okay. Now, so this was uh, basically uh, there was a fear among the British that uh, once Spain become very powerful, it is going to disturb the balance of power in uh, balance of power in Europe, and that was the reason for this battle after the death of after the death of Prince uh, uh, after the death of the King of Spain Charles II in 1700. So the battle was fought between. The Battle of Blenheim was fought between uh, 1701 to 1740. It was a long drawn out battle. Okay. And uh, now, so that is the background of the poem. But the poem is talking about a theme. And what is the theme? He is talking about the futility of war. The futility of war.
He is basically discussing the uselessness. Futility means uselessness. It's worthless. You have fight a battle. Any battle, any war is a, a useless thing. Right? Therefore, we call it an anti war fight. Anti means against. Anti war. Alright? So basically the battle of or the uh, after Blenheim is a poem written as an anti war poem. You see? Anti means against war. Okay. So that is it. The poem is an anti war poem written by it talks about the worthlessness or use uselessness of uh, any battle. Alright, and uh, as the poem, usually every poem has a particular poem and uh, some poems like the sonnets are there, then you have epics are there, then you have uh, uh, various types of poems are there and this particular poem is a ballad. What's the ballad? Ballad is a a narrative poem A narrative poem telling a story A narrative poem telling us a story So that is the quality of a ballad now originally this this type of poem, ballad, was transmitted orally. That means by word of mouth. There were there were people who would go around singing, and they were called as a minstrels. What were they called as minstrels? They were wandering singers. They would go from place to place telling a story in poetry. Alright? Or in poetry. Okay. And then they were quite popular and therefore these ballads were ballads were usually transmitted orally and not in written form. Originally ballads were Sung by minstrels or wandering poets or wandering singers. Then, and therefore, as as it is, uh, uh, it was meant. Uh, it, it had to be memorized by these uh, these poets who were telling this story in poem. They employed uh, certain techniques in it. Hmm? They had. Uh, Special style, and the style that is followed in this this particular one is a, a conversation. The style of this poem is a, in the form of a conversation, a conversation that happens between uh, two generations. Okay, the old man Casper and his two grandchildren, Wilhelmine and Peter King, two grandchildren. The old so a conversation that takes place between these people belonging to two age groups, the old man Casper and the the young uh, his grandchildren. Peter King and Wilhelm. Okay? So that's the that's the style that is followed in this, the style of a conversation between two. And then a ballad usually employs certain certain elements that makes it easy for the person to remember. And one of them and uh, uh, more attractive. And one of them is a refrain. What's a refrain? A refrain is a, a repetition 
repetition of a phrase refrain means repetition of a phrase a word or verses Rephrase is a repetition. Repetition of what? Maybe a phrase, maybe a verse, or maybe verses. What is a verse? Verse is a line. Just like in prose, we call uh, a sentence. In a poetry, we call a sentence a verse. And verses therefore means sentences in a in a poem is known as a verses. Okay. So you have a, a, a refrain happening like in this for instance uh, you will find the repetition of a, a, a line for instance that it was a famous victory. The old Casper repeats a number of times this particular thing at the end of stanzas that it was a famous victory for instance. Okay, then the the next quality that you notice in this is it, is, it follows a particular rhyme scheme. I have explained to you what's a rhyme. Rhyme is a a repetition of a, a repetition of a, a syllable at the end of a, each line, all right, which uh, rhymes with each other. And uh, as per that, so you have here the rhyme scheme that is followed is the rhyme scheme is uh, this follows the rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme that is followed is A B. C, B, and B, D. So each stanza of this particular poem has how many lines? Six lines. Six lines. Alright? And the first line does not match the ending of the first line. The ending sound of the first line does not match with any other. And the second and Fourth line rhyme together, and then the third line does not match with any other, and the last two lines, the last two lines match each other in its ending sound. Like for instance, you have here the last two lines of a and by him spotted on the green his little granted Wilhelmine. Alright, so you have here the green rhyming with Wilhelmine. Wilhelmine and the green rhyming together. That is D and D. Alright. Okay. And then so that is the, the rhyme scheme is a A, B, C, B and D, D. So each stanza contains six lines. Then another quality that is employed is what we call alliteration. What is alliteration? I have told you earlier an alliteration is a repetition of repetition of or consonant sounds consonant sound consonant a repetition of consonant sounds within a line within a line all right so you have examples of such repetitions 
as it would happen here in this particular poem you have for instance in your in the before ninth line for instance they say it was a shocking sight they say it was a shocking sight in the ninth stanza we have they say it was a shocking sight okay so here you have a repetition of yes, sight, hmm? all right. So this is a, a alliteration, okay. This a alliteration. So when we come to the text, I shall uh, give you more instances. And then another thing that we notice in this is another thing that we notice in this particular poem is is repetition. Repetition is naturally repeating an idea. And here, each stanza, almost every stanza in this particular poem, uh, repeats this, uh, the, an idea. The idea of that it was a famous matter. The idea that it was a famous battle is repeated almost in a, every stanza. And the next quality that we notice is a irony. Irony is what? Irony is the irony is a figure of speech in which you mean exactly opposite of what you say. When you want to say something, when you say something that is exactly opposite of what you really intend, we call it irony. Okay? So the, the greatest example of a irony in the poem is, they say it was, uh, it was a famous it was a famous it was a famous picture the old man Caspar repeats this idea it was a famous victory a number of times but what does he actually want to convey? What does the poet actually want to convey by saying this? He wants to say just the opposite of it. It was a waste. Waste of property. Waste of life. Thousands of soldiers sacrificed their lives. Lost their lives in the battle. And their bodies lay rotting on the fields. Very inhuman death. Very inhuman death. They lost not only their lives, they lost their dignity as well. Alright? So that much for our introduction to this particular poem. So I have told you uh, the background to the poem. That is, it was written about a battle a historical battle that took place when there was this problem of a succession to the throne of Spain after the death of the king of Spain Charles the second who died childless and this happened in the year 1700 and then there was a long drawn out battle that was fought and uh, the actual battle of Blenheim that we are talking about did happen in the year of uh, 1700 and uh, 4. 1704. And about this battle, 
the poet Robert Southey writes in the a poem in 1796. And he wants to convey us a message. The worthlessness of war, the uselessness or the futility of war of all kinds. Battles ultimately cause loss of lives, property, and it is a it it, it makes not the the soldiers who die in battle not only lose their lives but they also die an inhuman death or they face an inhuman death they lose their dignity as well but that is against the heroic ideas of battle because soldiers were were considered gallants in those days there was heroism associated with the battles and soldiers so he is talking against this kind of a, a false belief. The soldiers are not heroes, they die an inhuman death. That's what the poet wants to convey to us. And uh, the poet has followed a, a particular format, a particular type of poetry that is ballad. A ballad is a narrative poem telling a story and it has uh, certain peculiarities and the first peculiarity is the original ballads were meant to be sung and, uh, and when it was sung uh, these poets going from place to place they uh, roamed the countryside they sang these uh, ballads singing ballads was a common entertainment. And these kind of wandering poet or singers were known as called minstrels. Right? So you have, for instance, in, a, in a, one of the popular forms of uh, this kind of uh, ballad you have in the Caribbeans, it's known as calypsos. Calypsos. People. There are people who go around singing calypsos. Or, uh, it's a, the, it is the version of, Caribbean version of Bala. And then, it has certain qualities of style. And the first style is, a, I said, it employs the style of a conversation between a grandfather and his a grandchildren. Yes. Then it has what? A refrain. That is a repetition of lines. Then you have a rhyme scheme, a particular rhyme scheme, and the rhyme scheme that is followed in this is A B C B D D. A B C B D D. Alright? I had explained to you in the class earlier what a rhyme scheme is, the ending of a line. The ending of a line matching with the another or not matching with that. That's it. Okay. Then you have uh, instances of alliteration, repetition of consonant sounds within a within a line. Okay. Then you have a, a repetition, repetition of a, a, an idea. And here, I said, it was a famous victory. The idea of a famous victory is repeated, but the poet actually questions, was it famous or was it just the opposite of it? Infamous. Okay. Then, I said, irony. Irony is a figure of speech which employs which employs a technique whereby you mean to say one thing whereas you intend to say exactly the opposite of what you mean to say. 
and the example is it was a famous victory but what do you really want to say it was an infamous in print and not obvious is sir the uh, something worse could not have happened all right okay now with this i have given you a little bit of introduction and now we proceed with the point Let's proceed with the poem here. So I shall read a few stanzas, and then after reading those few stanzas, we shall proceed further. Okay. After Blenheim, it was a summer evening. Old Casper's work was done, and he, before his cottage door, was sitting in the sun. and by him spotted on the green his little grandchild with her mane she saw her brother peter kill roll something large and round which he beside the rivulet in play they had found he came to ask what he had found that was so large and smooth and round old casper took it from the boy who stood expectant by and then the old man shook his head and with a natural sigh it is some poor man's poor fellow's skull said he who fell in the great victory i find them in the garden for there are many here about and often when i go to plow the plow shall turn the mount for many thousand men said he was slain in the great victory now tell us what what it was all about young peter skin peter in christ and little will hemen looks up with wonder waiting eyes now tell us all about the war and what they fought each other for it was the english casper said casper cried who put the french to rout but what they fought each other for i could not well make out but everybody said caught he that it was a famous victory my father lived at blenheim then your little stream hard by they burned his dwelling to the ground and he was forced to fly so with his wife and child he fled nor he where to rest his head with fire and sword the country round was wasted for far and wide and many a child in mother then and new born baby died but then things like that you know must be a famous victory they say it was a shocking sight after the field was won for many thousand bodies here lay rotting in the sun but things like that you know must be after a famous victory great praise the duke of marlborough won and our good prince eugene why it was a very wicked thing said little wilhelmy nay nay my little girl what he it was a famous victory who this great fight did win but what good came of it at last hot little peter's king peter king why that i cannot tell said he but it was a famous victory so that is a lovely poem a beautiful story in it 
and with the great theme that uh, this should not have happened. Battles are never to be fought. Okay, so it's an anti war poem. Let's now go stanza by stanza. Alright? As we go, it was a summer evening, old Casper's work was done, and he before his cottage door was sitting in the sun. And by him spotted on the green his little grandchild with the mean. Alright? So it was it was a, a very uh, we get a beautiful picture of an evening. The sun sets very late in the in the summers in this part of the world, and uh, the old man after a hard day's labor is a farmer by profession, and he is uh, sitting and relaxing. And at that time, what happens? Old Casper's work was done. And he, before his cottage door, so in front of his cottage door, he is sitting there, and and in the in the evening sun, in the evening sun, and by him spotted, spotted means played, spotted means played, he was playing there. On the green, the lush green ground was playing. His granddaughter Wilhelmine was playing. His little grandchild Wilhelmine. Wilhelmine is a is a granddaughter. Now you must learn to spell that name, Wilhelmine. Alright? So you learn to spell the name Wilhelm. Now look at this. So you have the old man sitting there outside his cottage door and you have the little children playing about. And first we notice Wilhelm, his granddaughter, playing about the lush green lawn. Lush green lawn. Okay. So the and uh, she saw her brother Peter King roll something large and round, which he beside the river had found in playing there and found. He came to ask what he had found that was so large and smooth and round. Okay? And she saw her brother Peter King. She was playing in front of the in front of the cottage door, in the lawn, the green lawn, as a, she was playing, she noticed something. He said, her brother was approaching him. And what was he doing? He was playing about with something that was round. Not only really round, it was smooth and large. And what was it? Obviously, it was a, it was a, it was a human skull. But the children did not know it was a human skull. The children did not know that it was a human skull. See, he was playing ball with it. Possibly, or probably he thought that it was a it was a ball. Alright? He did not know. So he came over. She saw her brother Peter Kill roll something large and round. Round like a, let's say, a football. <laughs> okay. Something that like was large and round, like a football. Which he beside the rivulet. Rivulet is a small a river. Okay. A small river is called a rivulet. Just like a small of a pig is called piglet. Alright? A small of a pig is called what? A piglet. Okay. In the same way, a small river is called a rivulet. So he had found 
on the banks of the river this particular object that was smooth and large and round in playing there he had found as he was playing about the on the banks of the river he had found it and he came to ask what he had found he wanted to know from his grandfather what object was this that was so large and smooth and round so he wanted to know this that's why he came old kasper took it from the boy who stood expectant by and then the old man shook his head and with a natural sigh tears some poor fellow's skull said he who fell in the great victory and the old man old kasper the old man takes it is a peter kings and will he means grand father takes this uh, takes this object that was lying there and he he takes it into his hand and then what does he say he says took a round thing from the boy took this round thing from the boy who stood expectant by expectant by means waiting for an answer in anticipation in anticipation or eagerly waiting for an answer in anticipation expectant by means eagerly waiting or waiting in a anticipation to an answer to the question that he had asked and what was the question he had asked what is this object that he had discovered by the on the branch of a the rivulet he had found it as he was playing about on the banks of the river and the old man takes it and then the old man shook his head he shook his head as if to suggest as if to suggest he knew the answer all right yeah this can this is a very common sight as if to suggest that this is a very common thing around here and what is he said and with a natural sigh as a as he saw this oh yet another skull kind of an expression that a sigh all right he sighed and uh, said it is some poor fellow's skull it is some poor fellow poor fellow fellow here means who is the poor fellow it is some poor fellow some soldiers it is the skull of a some soldier said he who fell in the great victory fell fell he means fell dead fell dead all right fell he means fell dead all right so he says this is the skull of a soldier who died in the battle of blood head all right in those days the battles were fought on the ground on open fields usually or a plain areas were selected where plain flat land was the selected and uh, the battles were fought face to face all right those days we did not have such uh, advanced technology therefore it was a battle between individuals in mass all right okay so he says one of the soldiers who were killed in the battle this was the skull of a person and then what explanation does he give for the for the he gives the explanation